feel that. <laughs> so I'm going to say good morning, good morning. Happy Monday. So today we're talking about some highly relevant material, multiple offers, escalation clauses. Uh, it's really everywhere right now, right? We're all kind of going through the same thing. So it's imperative that we have the opportunity to really understand what our obligations are, what the risks are, what the rules are. So do we want to start first with the multiple offers themselves? Good morning, Patricia, or the escalation clauses. Anybody have a preference on where you'd like to start? Okay, then we're going to go my way. All right. So let's say you're representing a buyer in this particular uh, scenario that we're in right now. How many of you have buyers and you can't get a house? Because every time you put an offer, it's gone. Yes. And every home is multiple offers. Yes. <laughs> right? Are we all going through this? So there is something we can do to help our buyers, and it's called an escalation clause. Has any of so you guys are just joined? Come get one of each of these, Patricia. Uh, okay, so today it's very important that we understand you have an option for our buyers, and it's called an escalation clause. One of each. So what is an escalation clause? Uh, what does it mean? Does anybody out there have used one? Has anybody used an escalation clause yet? Yes. No. Oh, yes. Who's that? Hi, Ms. Liz. Who, who said yes? I missed the yes. All right. Teresa. Well, Teresa, how did it work for you? We got the home. Woo! And it works. Okay. That's the point of the escalation clause. So we're going to look at the escalation clauses are already loaded in dot loop. I had put them in there a while ago because it's not the first we've heard of escalation clauses. They're not new. So how do you find your escalation clause? Okay, what you're going to need to do is go into your dot loop. And I have put them in put them into one location it is in it's under um, frequently used sales agenda. So if you click into frequently used sales addendum, you will see contract addendum escalation. The other place you will find it is, yes, a new folder I created for you just today, multiple offers. This is kind of all encompassing. So your multiple offers has your escalation clause. It has some um, addendums we're gonna go over that are disclosure forms for buyers and sellers when we're dealing with multiple offers. Now, I'm not gonna tell you you need to use those addendums. Those addendums aren't required. It's not like the piece or, you know, disclosures or the wire fraud, but it's not a bad idea. If we think this home is gonna go multiple offers, it's not a bad idea to show the sellers the disclosure about multiple offers. If we think we're in a multiple offer situation, it's a great idea to submit it to a buyer that you're gonna put in on a multiple offer. So they understand any buyers that's putting in an offer on your multiple offer home, they have a disclosure that explains what the liabilities are, what the risks are, what the duties of the sellers are. It's very clear. So first let's talk about the escalation clause. So we're gonna open that one up, which I have, I think right here. And this is it. So if you guys open that, the idea of an escalation clause is it's really the best way to describe it, guys, is it's eBay. Okay. <laughs> right? Right, eBay. What do you do? You want to bid on something. And so they have these things where you can set parameters, right? They're like bidding things. And so every time the bid goes up, you've authorized your bid to increase, say, $5. Morning, Beverly, take one of each. So you have set it up that your bid is going to automatically, as soon as it's a bit higher than you, jump up higher, right? You set the amount that it'll go up and you also set a ceiling that it won't go beyond, right? We've been doing this for years on eBay. I'm not a big eBay shopper, but maybe, but we all know about it, right? That is essentially your escalation clause. We have now brought the homes into eBay small buying. I'm just saying, that's what it is. So what it's letting you know here on this escalation, this would go with your uh, contract. So how do we, anybody, anybody, here we go for, for the, the gold star. How do we include an addendum and incorporate it into a contract? You check the box on the bottom and write it in if it's not a Tammy Schuster's got the gold star for the day. Hey, that is it, Tammy. Yes. <laughs> She's like, I paid attention. I love that. On the second to last page where all the additional addenda are, there's a line that says other. You check that 
and you write in contract addendum dash escalation, exactly what this is called. If you add an addendum at the time of contract and you don't incorporate it, it's not part of the contract. So you've got to make sure you make this escalation clause part of the contract. Do you want me to say it again, Rosanna? On the second to last page of whether it's a far bar or as is, doesn't matter. Where all the additional addendum, you know, home to sell contingency, um, you know, VA, FHA financing, all of those. There's a last one that says other. You check that box and you write in the name of this addendum, con uh, contract addendum escalation. Because if you don't do that, you're not incorporating this addendum into the contract. Now, just to bring this up, this came up the other day, guys. Anybody uh, want to share on this, you're welcome to do so. But here's the question, right? Let me make sure I've got all my participants. Okay. Um, if you have a contract already executed and there's a change to the contract, something in the terms are changing, the date is changing. Say the date of closing is changing. Do we ever go back to the contract and make the change and have everybody initial? No. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Tony. No, we don't because the contract's already executed. So any changes after that point must be made on an addendum. That addendum needs to be numbered. That addendum needs to be dated. That addendum needs to be, that will supersede the contract. So it needs to be worded extremely carefully, right? So if you are making changes, you don't go back to that contract that was executed already. That's like in stone now, right? Any changes come from these addendums. But to, to the point of this contract escalation clause, you're going to put this at the time of offer, right? So it needs to be included with that document. That's why you must incorporate it, check other, and write it there. Listen, any of you wanting to protect your commission, but of course, here's a question for another gold star. <laughs> Can we write our commission on a contract? You know where you put your names? Can you write your commission there? Anyone think no. loud? Uh huh. I see it all day long. I don't think so. Why would it be not allowed? Because uh, it was, I don't know, you talked about <laughs> no, 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 you can something I did talk about. <laughs> it's, not <laughs> it's not a good idea to show that. Um, okay, here's a short answer, but yeah. you are right. It's a code of ethics violation. Yeah, it's a code of ethics. It is a code of ethics violation to write your commission on an offer. We are not party to a, a residential, you know, or any kind of offer. It's between buyer and seller. We are party to, of course, the listing agreement. We are party to a broker buyer uh, disclosure, right? A agreement. But we are not party to a buy and sell contract. Yeah. So therefore we cannot incorporate ourselves or our commission. But if we ever want to be sneaky and make sure we're covered, you incorporate it into the document. You check other, you write MLS broker synopsis. Why do you want to use broker? The broker synopsis has the commission. Now we're not actually putting ourselves in there. We're just including the synopsis as part of the contract package, right? Are we covered? Yeah, yeah we are. Yeah. So in the instance that we do less than the street in this broker, we're not going to increase the commission uh -huh. How do, what's the best practice to make sure that they don't do Either. Okay. Did everybody get that? He says, what do we do for dealing with unscrupulous brokers? Not that bad. Even a thing. <laughs> but God forbid somebody were to change the offer of commission after you're in contract, which is the code of ethics violation and an MLS violation. Two violations right there. But what you do is one of two things. You either incorporate that MLS synopsis or you just take a screenshot of the MLS synopsis or download it and put it in your dot loop file, the date of contract. Because it's very simple when they're preparing that HUD and you're looking at those disclosures and you're like, oh, the commission is wrong. You just send that on to the title company and it will be fixed. So you don't have to really um, involve buyer or seller. It's better if you don't, but yes, good point. Okay, so back to the escalation clause itself. The reason that we're including it again into the contract is because this really is superseding the contract, right? And so let's look at what it says. So buyer and seller are parties to the certain contract dated, well, whatever day you're offering, right? And the parties wish to modify or supplement the terms of this agreement more particularly described herein. So what are they saying? They're saying it's like this ebb and flow. It's almost like a flexible purchase agreement, right? Because in an agreement, it has to be firm. Is honor before allowed in a contract? 
Nobody wants to answer me. It's allowed, but not preferred by you. It's actually not allowed, but I love you, Tammy. Is it not allowed? No, it's really not. If you call, and I would challenge each of you, go ahead and have a phone call with the, uh, the legal hotline. Uh, they're going to tell you, no, it's not an active contract because you need to have a specific date of closing. It's not like a guess. We might close. We might not, right? It can't. It has to have it has to have an offer of compensation. It has to have a date of closing. So if you at now, title companies all day long want you to do that because yeah. they're not attorneys. They're not real estate attorneys. And half the time, they don't understand the contracts. Mm -hmm. That's why you get it from a title company. And because it makes it easier for them right one less addendum they need to worry about but the reality is no if you ask the legal hotline they're going to tell you it is not an effective agreement without a specific date so that's why honor before is not good because again nobody knows clearly what they've agreed to right contracts are black and white but this is a little gray if you think about it right because we're putting in an offer say for five hundred thousand, but patricia's going to put an offer with her customer she's going to come in at 505 now, my offer without me doing anything because of the cessation clause is going to change. And Patricia, bump you out. You're out, girl. <laughs> so here's a couple things. Let's read it together, make sure we understand it. Okay, so buyer and seller hereby agree as follows. The foregoing recitals, so legal, right, are true and correct and are incorporated herein by reference. Notwithstanding any of the agreement and contrary, the agreement is hereby modified or supplemental. All that to say, we agree that we're modifying the terms, okay? If prior to seller's acceptance of buyer's offer to purchase, again, prior to their offer of purchase that they've accepted, and seller receives another prospective purchaser bona fide offer, which means it has to have deposit. It has to be a real customer. You know, it can't be your uncle, right? Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to really buy the house. Not that any of us would do that, but it has to be a real person uh, with terms acceptable to the seller and a net purchase price. Now this is very critical because a lot of times you add closing costs in, right? Not especially VA, FHA, right? That, so if they're saying I'm offering you $505,000, so it's better, but on the back page, it says buyer and seller agree, seller to contribute $10,000 towards closing costs, right? And prepays, if it says that, what is the net? It's 495. So now the escalation clause does not need to go into effect because it's not really a better offer by price alone. Now, again, remember, price alone does not determine the validity of an offer. There's a lot of things that make a good offer. You know, the stability of the product, right? Uh, closing, you know, are they willing, how much inspection? Mm -hmm. Cash. Cash. Sorry, can you repeat the, the last part of the, about the, the closing cost, please? Yes, hi, Miss Birthday Girl. Happy birthday to Marie de Gallego. Feliz cumpleaños. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, so again, just to go over that, I have an offer we put in for my customer. It's at 500,000. Patricia over there, she comes in with an offer for 500. Oh, five. I put in an escalation clause. Does it kick in? No, because Patricia's offer on the back page says buyer and seller agree seller to contribute $10,000 for its closing costs. So really the net gain to the seller would be four ninety five, dollars right? Because it's not five oh five. It's five oh five minus the 10,000 they're going to give to closing costs. Right. When we're presenting an offer to a seller, they're like, oh, this is a higher price. Is it? Are you adding any concession? Are you giving any money to closing costs, which is typically the one that you see, right? Are you agreeing ahead that you're going to complete a roof and on the other ones, you're not? That's a net to them, right? So these are things that will not go into play to make the escalation clause active. Yes. Well, just, for, just for over simplicity, yeah. if it was four, if it was four thousand dollars that was being contributed, then it would kick in because it would make the offer effective five hundred. Yes. So he said, Tony said, if you guys didn't hear, for simplicity, if the closing cost that they asked for is only $4,000, then the net is really 501. It's still above our 500. So our escalation clause would kick in. Everybody clear on that? Because that's important you understand that. All right. So now it says, with terms acceptable, okay, when we are doing the net, uh, a higher net purchase price. Okay, buyer agrees that the purchase price of buyer's offer is increased incrementally. So the net purchase price is blank higher than the net purchase price of the competing offer. So and let's say I say 5,000, okay? It's my eBay choice. I'm gonna go 5,000 above every time, right? So if it was 501, I'm now at 506. If it's at 505, 
I'm now at 510, 510. So this is not to be worried about because the next line very clearly says up to a maximum purchase price of. You have a ceiling. So if my ceiling is 512, I don't ever have to worry that this is going to go above and beyond that, right? My buyer is secure. Tony. This is also good for people that just fall in love with a house and just want to automatically immediately, oh, I'll give them $30,000 over. You may be able to sell them some money because maybe they're not going to get that offer. And they may give that out for like 520 or five. Exactly. So if you guys didn't hear Tony, he said this could actually save somebody. If somebody just totally loved the home and they're ready to come in 30000 above, you could say, well, you could. Or we could come in with an escalation clause and maybe save a little money. They will still get us there. Yeah, you, yeah. If your 530 is set as your limit, right? Yeah, yeah. But maybe they don't get many offers that rise above. Now, here's some things about this. And this is important. Seller will provide a copy of the competing offer to the buyer no later than the time the seller returns a copy of the executed agreement. So I get often asked, well, what about confidentiality, Carrie? That's the buyer's offer. You're not allowed. And in the state of Carolina, North Carolina, that is true. They cannot use escalation clauses because in North Carolina, it, they, they cannot show the offer due to the privacy and the confidentiality of the buyer. What? Hey, I thought that was you. I'm well, thank you. How are you? Okay, we're good. Okay, so, <laughs> so what the point is with that is in the state of Florida, are we single agents? No. We're transaction brokers. Transaction brokers are limited confidentiality, right? Because of that status of limited confidentiality, that does one really great thing. We do not have to worry there is unless the buyer's offer had something written in by an attorney right that said they want a total confidentiality it is not included they, now do we show all their information no right we're going to be careful about not wanting to show too much we're going to cross out their name right but we are going to show that offer, in terms of that offer because it's important that the seller show us that they really have a real offer right otherwise I could be raising my price and I didn't need to, right? So that's important. Now, the seller Gary, agreed. Yes. Gary, I'm sorry. So you said we can cross, what, what, what should we do in that, uh, in that situation? We can cross their name or the last name or- Yes, if you're representing the buy and the seller and you're going to show this offer, you're gonna cross out the name of the person who gave you the offer. Oh, the seller, I'm sorry, yeah. Because it's important that they just see that, you know, you don't even have to see the whole contract, right? It's the first page of the contract to show they truly have an offer. The first page of the contract is going to tell you if it's cash or if it's financing, right? And if it doesn't, because it conflicts with the second page, which I see all the time, it's written like cash, but on the second page, it says financing. You guys, I see that all the time. It's like craziness. You need to have them fix that offer so the front page is truly reflective of what the offer is and then cross at the buyer's name and submit that because it's very important that you're showing the real offer, right? Also, if there were any kind of concessions that has to be shown, right? Because again, it's the net that we're looking at. Okay, the seller agrees to a final escalation purchase price of blank not to exceed the maximum purchase price. Except as contained herein, all terms, covenants, and conditions of the agreement are hereby ratified and confirmed and shall remain in full force and effect. So what does that mean? It doesn't affect anything else. It doesn't affect inspection. It doesn't affect appraisal. So what do you do with an appraisal, right? I hate leaving blanks. I'm not a blank lever, but in this instance, I would leave a blank on the um, financing contingency. I always write in the purchase price, but we don't know the purchase price. So if this offer is also going with a financial contingency, leave it blank. Can't believe those words are coming out of my mouth. But if you leave it blank, it says right next to the blank, if left blank, the purchase price, which in this instance would benefit you, right? Because that purchase price may change based on this escalation clause. So does that mean if you're putting in an escalation clause, you shouldn't do an appraisal contingency? No. I would still definitely have an appraisal contingency, you know, because now, Listen, there are times we are in a crazy, crazy uh, real estate market right now. There are times when the buyer's like, I don't care. I'll leave a wave of inspection. I'll wave it all. Like, I highly do not recommend counseling your customer that is okay. Because guess what? They're in the heat of the moment. They're driven by emotion. When logic comes in, who are they going to be really mad at? You. 
because you were supposed to protect them. You were supposed to educate them and you were supposed to be the person that they were hiring, right? To counsel them. Did you do a good job? I mean, that's really up to you, right? You have to make sure. So, okay, now, and then both parties sign this. Now, let me ask you, does a seller have to agree to accept this? No. No. Uh-huh, the escalation clause itself. No. Everybody's right. You all get gold stars. No, they don't have to. Here's another question. If they agree to your escalation clause, can they do multiple offers where they're saying it's a multiple offer situation? Can you guys the best? No, yes. well, they can ask, but you're, you've already given them your highest and best. Condition. Yeah, you can't actually do the highest and best when you already have an escalation clause. So you really can't do that. Now, of course, they're going to receive multiple offers, right? But they can't call everybody and say highest and best. And they do. I mean, the reality here is disclosure in the state of Florida, where we're transaction brokers, has more to do with what the seller will allow us to disclose, right? So just like, are we required to say there's multiple offers? Is there a requirement? No. no. If you're representing the seller, I know I have multiple offers. Beverly, you call and you ask me, is there multiple offers? Am I required to tell you? No. Beverly, like, yeah. I don't really know and I want to answer. Yes, okay. <laughs> the reality is only if the seller has allowed us to do so. It's a courtesy. So what we need to do to represent our customers and work with our other realtors appropriately is when we have multiple offers, ask immediately to the seller, well, as soon as you have an offer, may I share with anybody that there's, this is a multiple offer situation? They have to give you the authority to do that, right? And again, this is a transaction brokered relationship. So there is limited confidentiality. So we need to okay, know that they questions. are okay with that. Sure. Gary. Um, I missed okay. um, number one on this addendum on number one, the second, the, where the maximum pack purchase price is, is that the same as we would put on number two? Yes. The seller finally okay. agrees to a final escalation purchase price. Now, listen, this goes back when all parties have signed it, right? So this, when we put it in, this is blank. These prices are here because let's say we put in 500, uh, 5,000 and we're going to go up to 530. But the escalation period only brought us to 515. Then when the seller is going to send us back an executed copy, he has to sign this. Okay. That this is the price he's the final escalation purchase price. The seller agrees to the final escalation purchase price of 530. Okay, right? great. Say there's um the other thing with this is if he says he agrees to 530, right? And now he says, I don't agree anymore. Can the seller back out? Yeah. No. Well, unfortunately, according to Florida Realtors, uh, they can back out. It's not business, but if it's not truly executed, if you don't receive back a fully executed contract, and remember, this is an offer status. Keep that in mind. So also, if your offer said it was going to expire on Monday, but this situation runs past till Wednesday, is your contract still valid? It's not, right? You have to keep that in mind when you're using an escalation clause. You may have to resubmit your offer with a date that would allow this to be effective until, you know, the Wednesday or Friday, whatever day. So you got to okay, keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Um. I know it's highly unlikely, but if someone has the identical escalation clause, what happens? Well, so that's the thing. The sellers are not allowed to accept multiple escalation clauses. If they accept an escalation clause, that means they're not accepting an escalation clause from anybody else. That would be a conflict, yeah. right? So that's just like saying they're going to say, okay, highest and best at this time, and I have an escalation clause, right? Like I have my cake and it too. Yeah. So there's certain things and you will see on this particular document. I have sent you, I've given you two things. This one is a really good source. It comes from the National Association of Realtors. 
and it explains the rules and the things that they need to keep in, in mind to prepare them for multiple offers. So there's information for buyers and there's information for sellers. See, so it says, for example, that they have to you know, accept the best offer, which again, the best offer may not be the highest offer. It explains that if they have questions about multiple offers, they have to ask the listing broker to explain this prior to it happening. So they have a lot of information here that it gives them the idea of what a multiple offer situation could look like. So this is a fabulous document. It talks about the code of ethics obligations that we have to be honest and do fair dealings with all parties. That's why we can't say, Oh yeah, we got another one coming in at 520. You better go up on your offer when we don't have one coming in at 520. Like we can't make that up, right? That's not fair, honest and dealing. So it this is a really good thing because if you have that buyer who says, well, just yeah, tell them it's gonna be 520 and see what they do. Right? Has anybody dealt with that customer? Tell them I'm gonna come in at 520, see how they'll react. First of all, that's why we always check will not accept verbal offers. Because that's what people do with verbal offers, right, guys? They're trying to figure out a situation like million dollar listing to try to work out the best price, which typically is not in the best interest of the seller. Because if they say, okay, well, will they accept 520? And then you ask your seller, and he goes, yeah, we'll take 520. Then you go tell them, okay, we'll take 520, and then they come in at 510. Right? Don't think this doesn't happen. They want to know what your ceiling is, and they're going to try it. It's a tactic to get them information out of you. So don't fall for that kind of thing. You've got to be very, very careful that you are representing your customer in the best way. So that's why we don't take verbal offers, right? That's a really big thing. And especially if we're dealing with a multiple offer situation, if the seller has allowed you to say, okay, uh, yeah, you can tell people the highest offer, right? You're allowed to tell people that. You're allowed to say we have multiple offers, and the highest offer is 520 at the moment. Now, that is not always a good thing for the seller because that people might not want to put in an offer now and they may have lost the opportunity to actually get a higher price. So if you're going to be talking to a seller, you want to make sure they understand the pros and the cons of telling the information. So first of all, I would recommend if you are in right now a situation with a buyer or a seller and there's a potential of multiple offers, give them this. This is now loaded into dot loop. It's from the National Association of Realtors and actually we should put Florida Association of Realtors right there, right? Or, uh, Orlando, right? We, I would put Florida Realtors. But anyway, it's from the National Association of Realtors. What's great about that is it's not you. <laughs> right? I mean, let's be honest. You want them to know what's fair dealings, not because you're saying it, but because National Association of Real. Okay. Another thing I want you all to see that I have now added as well into this dot loop is these particular multiple offer forms. There are two here to protect you. One of them is for a seller, and one of them are for buyers. They're both in that same folder. So this is to the seller. And this is when you are even on a listing and you're like, this home is going to go super fast. We're probably going to have multiple offers, right? I mean, we all know. Listen, if it's a $1.5 million listing, that should be a million. We're not really concerned, right? <laughs> but if it's a $500,000 house that all day long is selling, yeah, we know, right? So I would suggest giving this disclosure is it a requirement no but is it a good idea all day long so let's take a look at this now this is not a new form by the way this is from 2019 it has been around but i think now more than ever it's really important to be able to have this harry yes is there any way you can ask everyone to mute because there's a lot of back i know i just muted the whole thing okay it sound better yes Okay, good. Yeah, I think I got it. Okay, so let's take a look. As a seller, you should be aware that during the listing process, you may receive more than one offer on your property at approximately the same time, i.e. multiple offers. There are several options for you to consider if this occurs, each with its own benefits, risks, and potential legal consequences. Here are some commonly used options so that you, the seller, can provide the direction to the brokerage as to how you would like to proceed. The decision about how to proceed with any offer is entirely up to you, the seller. 
Why is this good? Because if a seller comes back to you later and says, well, I think you made the wrong choice. You let me to pick the wrong offer. See, if you had this disclosure already given, who's covered? Right? I don't know about you guys, but when it's a multiple offer situation, CYA, okay? Hugely important. It says you can accept or counter the best offer and reject others. So it's not like you have to accept it face value, right? They can counter it. Uh, is it possible in a multiple offer situation for you to simply accept or counter the best offer that you receive, thereby rejecting all offers. They can do that. It's important to understand the risks of doing this, though. Of course, because if you are countering one offer, the buyer may not accept that counter, which means there's no agreement. And during this time, it is possible that another interested buyer may have moved on to other properties. Like, are we taking the time to explain that? Because that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question. You do a counter offer. How long is that offer unless it's written otherwise? alive for 24 hours Four. counter is 48 hours so i get an offer from patricia right and we want to counter it so i give it back to her today is monday we have 48 hours that that lives 48 hours two days in the interim rosanna might put in an offer right what if i like her offer better can i withdraw my counter It's not an executed contract. You can always withdraw an offer. It doesn't matter if it's made by the buyer or seller. Remember, an offer is simply an offer to purchase and can be withdrawn before it's executed, right? So we had a situation just like that with Janet Hoffman. She was so cute. She's like, Carrie, I don't know. We've got a counter. They want to counter the other one. Can you do two counter offers? I mean, that's getting a little weird, right? So what we did is instead is we withdrew our counter and we went with multiple offer situation after talking to the seller and they wanted to do that. And that way we got the best offer, which actually came from the second offer, not our counter. But could that have blown up? Yeah. So this is where we have to make sure we are counseling our customers properly. And I don't want any one of you responsible for that, which is why I'm recommending these documents right here. So let's keep reading because it really does break it down. During this time, is it possible that another interested buyer may have, oh, okay. Additionally, in responding to only one buyer's offer, you may not be getting the best price as it's possible that if the buyer had known there were other interested parties, the buyer would have increased the purchase price, right? That's why it's good to let them know that there's multiple offers, but it's not always good. You can respond with counter offers to some or all of the offers you've received with this option. To avoid the potential of being under contract with more than one buyer, you would need to reserve the right to be bound to only one accepted counter offers in your response. This would require disclosure to each of the interested buyers that the counter offers from you is one of a number of counter offers that you're making. This is what we didn't want to do. If we were telling people, listen, we're countering multiple offers, people might be like, I don't like the feeling of that. You're running the show here, right? That's why we chose to recommend to the seller instead to withdraw your counter and simply ask the buyers to submit their best offer, right? And I know a lot of these things you'll see on the buyer one, it says highest and best. We've heard it for years, REOs did it. It's really not highest is always best, right? So that's a little bit to me, not deceptive, but confusing, right? Because then they might think, well, it's the highest price, so it's the best offer may not be right may not be at all what are the terms and conditions if we have to wait six months to close and there's a post or pre-occupancy in there is that a good offer because i'm running from that thing all day long right mm -hmm. so we got to be very careful that we look at the entire offer okay so very yes mm -hmm. oh i'm sorry i thought you you finished with this document uh mm -hmm. all right. when you're done i have a question but when this with this hey. sounds good maria all right so Sorry, real quick i'm so sorry can you huh? just tell me again the title i'm just trying to find this at the beginning sure. and i can't see multiple offer disclosure to seller under it's under offer. dot loop and it's yeah, under under. multiple offer the new folder i created okay i uh, uh, got it okay, okay now let's look at number three okay now so by the way number two it does state if therefore it's possible, so if they're saying I'm doing multiple counter offers, it's possible that the buyer should choose to withdraw from the negotiations. That's what we felt. Because think about it. A lot of times buyers are going to feel a little bit slighted if it's the seller in control of the offers, not the buyers, right? 
Not to say that it's always the case, but this is the things we have to make the seller aware of that could potentially happen. Could we have done multiple counter offers? Yes. With proper disclosure, letting everybody know we're countering, letting everybody know the time frame. Is it worth that? I don't think so. I think we would have lost and not gotten the best offer that we could have. Plus, we don't know what their best offer is, right? So if we're countering, we're telling them our cards, right? But we don't know what they might bring to the table that we might have thought of. Think of it like poker, right? Okay, you can ask all buyers to submit their highest and best offer with this option. You're going back to the buyers who submitted an offer and asking them to present their highest and best offer to the property. The buyers would be asked to supply this offer by a certain deadline. It is important to understand this could result in the buyer resubmitting the original offer or submitting a new one. You would then have the option of considering all highest and best offers and deciding to accept, reject, or counter. Similar to option two, any buyer could decide to withdraw from negotiations, which is important. You've got to think through that situation. In some instances, heck yeah, we got like eight offers. We want to tell everybody there's multiple offers for a couple reasons. Agents especially and buyers also get very upset when their offers are not accepted. So sometimes there is an illusion that they feel you're not presenting their offer. I'm not going to say it has happened that we didn't feel that we were being presented, which is why at the last page of a contract, it states whether the, uh, the seller is accepting or rejecting the offer. I highly recommend if you have a multiple offer situation, either they accept it or they reject it and you send it back to that agent. You never want that agent to feel, more importantly, the buyer to feel the offer wasn't presented and, and in a fair terms too, remember. We have to be very careful Okay, if you as the seller are in a multiple offer situation, your realtor must check with you as to how you'd like to proceed, including on whether or not to disclose that there are multiple offers. Understanding that your options with regards to your response to any offer. And so it's important that you properly instruct the brokerage on how to handle the negotiation process if you receive more than one offer approximately at the same time. Please consult an attorney if you have any questions. We always say that, why? C-Y-A. This entire document is a C-Y-A, but it's also very educational, right? So I would recommend if you have a seller and you are dealing with multiple offers, give them this agenda just as more of an educational opportunity and mostly to cover yourself. Now, here's a question and Marie, I'll get to you in a second. Let's say one of the offers that are multiple offers are being represented by you because we're transaction brokers, right? We can represent both sides. Now what? Anybody? Okay, painful, I'm just gonna come in. This is where I step in. I would present the offers, yes. So if you ever have that situation where there's multiple offers and one or more of the offers is coming from buyers that you are representing, I think it's imperative that everybody understands this was done in an unbiased way, right? So if that is the case, I will be more than happy to step in for you and present the offers with you. You'll be there, but I will present the offers to your seller. And then we want to notify every one of the buyers that my broker will be presenting the offer, right? It is important they understand that we are handling this with the utmost of not only respect, but care and diligence, right? Because we want everybody to know this is fair dealings. Yeah. Okay, any questions on that? So if you have this situation, you reach out to me. Uh, we could do it via Zoom. We could do it in person. I don't really care, but it is imperative. And I honestly believe not only will the seller be impressed, but also will the agents on the other side. Okay. Uh, you know, I laugh because it's really been in our uh, policy and procedures manual that all multiple offers would be presented by me, which I always thought was so silly. But in this particular case, I would need to present a multiple offer. Any questions on that or anything in this document? I have a question, Carrie. Yes, hit me. Um, so I understand that like the sellers determine whether or not to present or to tell the buyer's agents if there's multiple offers, but does the listing agent also have to say, ask for highest and best, or is that optional? Because I've been in that situation where they don't. So I'm just curious. Nope. As per here, number three, yeah. they can ask to submit their highest and best, but they don't have to. It is really up to what the seller wants to do. In some instances, the seller might feel that if people knew that we're doing this, they might pull their offers. They might feel like, oh, this, I, this is a house I don't want to be involved in. 
right? That happens on eBay all the time, right? You see too many bidders and you're like, I'm out. I'm not going to bid on that one. I'm going to move on to the next. I mean, I hate to, you know, actually create some kind of a parallelism to our homes and eBay, but we're kind of there, right? So <laughs> let's work with what we understand. Okay. Now that's one of the options. There's another form that's in here for you. And this is great when you are representing the seller and you have multiple offers. It's the one to the buyers. And so this is a disclosure form, also listed in the same place, saying what the property is, who the sellers and the listing brokerage and the buyers and their brokerage. And they're saying the seller has requested each buyer submit their highest and best offer by when? on such and such a date. So by 5 p.m. Wednesday, March 10th, whatever. Other offers submitted by the deadline are subject to the following. All offers must be in writing. Don't come to me with that verbal stuff. Offers may be submitted to the listing agent via email or personal delivery. That's a weird one. Seller has sole and absolute discretion to accept, counter, or reject any offer received. Seller is not required to accept any offer regardless of the terms, conditions, and has the right and discretion to reject all offers received, right? Just because you're in multiple offer doesn't mean you got to sell, right? After receiving all offers, seller has the right to further negotiate the terms, conditions of any offer. This is when they could counter with everybody and disclose to everybody that they're doing counter offers with everybody if they wanted. Because they already did highs the best, right? <laughs> they didn't get what they wanted. So they could do this. Now it's sounding like a round robin, if you ask me, but this is absolutely liable. Seller has no obligation to negotiate or communicate with each or every buyer. Important because a lot of buyers feel they do. Right? So this is a really good disclosure for the, sell the buyer. Seller can make the decision to accept an offer based on the criteria they deem appropriate under the circumstances and in the seller's sole judgment because price is only one factor that may be considered. Because some of these might say, well, I have the highest offer. I know I have my offers the highest. You know, this is discrimination or something that you're not accepting my offer, right? We're hearing stuff like that. It is imperative that they understand Hey, Maria, every offer is being represented evenly and it's up to the seller and the seller's sole discretion which offer they want. It has nothing to do with, you know, highest price, it could be anything. If the seller accepts the buyer's offer and such offer does not result in a closed sale of the property, the seller may, in the seller's sole discretion, reopen negotiations with any buyer. And the seller may also request the listing agent to solicit new offers. Other, this is things that if you want to put in there that they're requiring, like that they get to stay in the home for a certain period of time or, you know, things like that, terms and conditions. By signing this form, all signatories are acknowledging and understanding their terms and conditions of the disclosure. This is a fabulous disclosure, guys. If you are received, this is a great thing. When you want to go tell the agent there's multiple offers and we're allowed to do so because the seller said, go ahead, I would suggest sending this to each of the agents. Again, this is not a new form. This one's also from 2018, but today more than ever, super relevant. Yeah, this is super relevant. This is definitely one that said, because it's a job lead, we just want to click an autofill. Yes, <laughs> click an autofill. But, but what does this do guys? It sets the expectation that we're handling this properly. Yeah. It sets the expectation that the seller will be looking at all offers at a certain time and in their discretion may decide if they'd like to proceed, renegotiate or get something else. It's important because I think a lot of people don't understand how multiple offers really work. There's a lot of confusion about what's okay, what's not okay. And this is really, I think a great tool for you to do that. Any questions on those two uh, disclosures that I have added into dot loop? Maria, Perry, I, I have two. Okay, hit me. You have two questions. I have two okay. questions. Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, one, Go for number one. One of, them, one of them, just going back to the escalation clause, uh -huh. just to clarify, as if I'm representing the seller and an uh -huh. offer comes in with an escalation clause, but it's on, I've received multiple offers. If we choose to allow that escalation clause, can we ask for a best and final from the others? without going to the escalation clause specifically and saying best and final? No, because here you go, right here, escalation, which is really special because it's got two A's, so I really meant it was escalating. But <laughs> <laughs> if a seller chooses to accept an offer with an escalation clause, they can no longer issue multiple 
counter offers to interested parties, nor can they continue to negotiate with the highest bidder. That's the problem. So if the seller chooses to accept an escalation clause, they're taking that right away. And this is per the National Association of Realtors. So it's understand. important that we all understand this part. So the seller who accepts an offer with an escalation clause, let me close this little thing out here. Oh, why did that not, oh, good gosh, go away, okay. Yeah, I know, but not when I'm trying to do this. <laughs> a seller who accepts an offer with an escalation clause will never know exactly how much higher the final price of the home might've gotten, which is why it's important that you explain what an escalation clause is to your seller and how it could or could not benefit them. Listen, if you don't have many offers, you think you might get another offer and somebody wants to come in with an escalation clause, that could be a great thing for your seller, right? If their maximum price and the price they're starting at is somewhere they wanna be, Right, that's not a bad thing. But if we know we're gonna be getting five offers, if we're representing the seller, would we really want to take an escalation clause? Probably not. I mean, you gotta explain that to a seller, but if that's I were the seller, I wouldn't want to accept the escalation clause. I'd rather do the highest and best thing, try to see what I get, because remember, I can always counter. You can escalate it yourself. You don't need to Not to mention, <laughs> here's another little caveat with this escalation clause. Just think about this. They submitted this at the time of offer, right? So we already know what the highest price is. They told us. There's a ceiling on this, right? So listen, if you're representing a buyer who's like, I have to have that home and they don't care, the escalation clause could be a fabulous way to get that home. But know that you just gave all your cards out. Now, am I going to tell you that agents are not taking escalation clauses and doing highest and best? I know that they are. Is that allowable? No, no because Fair. nobody really understands the rules of the, high, the multiple offers, which is why we're going over it. Yes. Very, and that's where not getting confused because is, 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 that happens if, that was exactly the question I wanted to ask. The one Perfect. That, did uh, it, that only happens if the seller accepts it, but if it doesn't, the, the competition continues. I mean- Absolutely, Maria. So the, what it is, is if, if you accept an escalation clause, it does not mean that you can't accept other offers. It just means you can't call for highest and best, right? You can't say it's a multiple offer situation, highest and best. And that escalation clause is only gonna last as long as the offer will last. So if they wrote in two days on the offer, the escalation clause is only good for two days. So in some instances, it may make more sense to say, unfortunately, the seller's not willing to do an escalation clause at this time, but we are asking for everyone to submit their highest and best by Wednesday. And that's when you use the addendum for the buyers about multiple offers. You follow me? Use the addendum. They are your friends. They are created by Florida Realtors Legal Group. They are completely there to protect us. They're there to make sure that buyers and sellers understand what they're getting into. And guys, it's also gonna help you with the agent on the other side. who does not know what they're doing. This is an amazing okay. thing. Carrie, I do not, I'm in dot loop and I do not see a folder for multiple offers on in my- So if you go to dot loop, yep. I put it in uh, Southwest, Southeast, so I'm gonna log in as Southeast because you were Southeast. I'm in all of them. We're Southwest. I Southwest, think. yeah, you are, sorry. I was in Southeast, I'm going in Southwest. Okay. You should see if you go to templates. Right. Do you see the buyer folder? I see Southwest listing, let me see. Southwest listings, multiple offer. It should be right underneath that. I don't see it. You don't see it either? No, I don't see it. Okay. Hold on. Take a look now. Do you see it now? Let me refresh. No. I see it now. Yeah, I see it now. Under okay. South. That's on me. I was moving so fast I forgot to hit share. <laughs> Whoopsie. Don't you love your dot loop specialist over here? <laughs> I better go in there and share it on all of them because honestly, I was moving so fast this morning trying to make sure everybody had it in their offices that I forgot to hit share. I probably, yeah, I probably did that. I probably did mine, but we, uh, we'll do Refresh. It, it should be there now. You have it now, Patricia? Do, do you see it now? Okay, yeah. You should see it now. Okay. There we go. Let me make sure I get into Claremont too. 
Don't want Claremont be forgotten. Okay. Yeah, so I went into each of my offices because I didn't want to have this for all of people, you know, in dot loop. Because if, if you don't explain what this is, it's it could be used incorrectly. So it's just it's important because I'm doing this training that you guys know how to use it, right? So that's why I have it in here. Okay. So I'm just gonna make sure I hit share. That would be good. Mm -hmm. By the way, I added the buyer folder. I wanted because I was seeing, I'm so happy people are using exclusive broker buyer agreement, but if you pull it out of Florida Interactive Forms, there's four of them. Transaction broker is only the last one. There's single agency. There's no disclosure, no representation brokerage. And there's single agency transaction to transition, no transition to transaction. Confusing, right? So you don't have to do that anymore. It's right here in your dot loop. Okay. Yes. Uh, I am sorry, but just to clarify again, so I know exactly how to handle it because yeah. I have had in, in the past, uh, you know, the situation of escalation clause. So, so they send you an escalation clause, right? Uh, but it seems good, but you know, a, lot, a bunch of other offers are coming. So they send you right the first one and they give you two days to answer. It. And so how do you handle that? Because you don't have to sign right away. You can still ask for better, you know, best uh, uh, offers. Yes, higher true. Than best. No, you can't ask for highest and best. If your seller agrees to the escalation clause, right? If he hasn't signed it yet. No, but then he's not agreeing to the escalation clause. You can submit an offer with an addendum and they can say, I'm not, I'm going to accept your offer, but I'm not going to accept your escalation clause. That's why the seller has to sign that, right? And right agree away. to that. Right away? Yeah, it's on the escalation clause. If you looked at the escalation clause addendum, remember? it oh. says right in the bottom seller agrees to the final escalation purchase price of whatever that purchase price is right not to exceed the maximum purchase price if they're not mm -hmm. open to accepting this escalation clause then you can just not sign that keep going notify them that we're not accepting the escalation clause and keep go to highest and best or you can accept the escalation clause and still take offers but you can't call for highest and best that's the, the contract says uh, that we need to answer by in, in, by in 48 hours. No, so the contract says the offer is valid for 48 hours. Not that you have to reply in 48 hours, that it is a valid offer in 48 hours. Follow me? Totally different. So if you don't answer, it doesn't mean you accepted the escalation clause. You follow? So this is important. They understand this. Yeah, so, but that, then I get that offer. I keep getting other offers. And then tomorrow, the seller says, you know what, I'm going to get the escalation. I, I think I'm going to sign this. But during the first day, I'm telling everybody, I mean, people are telling me, uh, let's say that they're saying, oh, you know, uh, do you have any escalation clause or something? And let's say that the seller says, yes, tell them yes, or, or uh, whatever, you know, we have multiple offers. So we get a bunch of offers that day. So next day he decides I'm gonna sign this. So he can't anymore, but if, even if he says it was- You can accept hours. multiple offers. You just can't call for highest and best. You, you can accept offers coming in. There can be other offers. That's the point of the escalation clause, right? You just count, cannot call for highest and best. Gary, I think she's asking that if at the before the forty-eight hours, if that's the period is right. ends, and they haven't and they haven't they didn't sign right away, and after seeing the other offers coming in, her seller decides, you know what, I am going to do that. He can still go and sign the yeah the contract. He can still that's exactly what she's asking. They don't have to yeah. sign it on the first so, day. Yeah, okay. no, no, no. He can still decide within the time that the offer is valid that he'll accept the escalation clause, but he cannot be calling for highest and best at the time, and he cannot be issuing counter offers. Uh, even if he hasn't signed, well, I don't well, know. If he, if he has not signed and he issues right. a counter offer, he can no longer do the escalation clause because he's putting out his own counter offers. So Gary, I think what like now you're negotiating against yourself. Yeah. So, so you're I saying if, if an offer comes in with an escalation clause and they have 48 hours to sign it and they don't sign it right away, even with the offer on the table, even if they haven't signed it. Th that now they're restricted to say, I can't ask for highest and best? Well, you know, if they're not allowing for the escalation clause, remember when they have an escalation clause, they have to prove that they had higher offer. They have to send the contract 
crossing of the details of the buyers that they have a higher offer. So this is an offer they're accepting, but they can't do that and be countering and have highest and best. Right. But I'm saying, I think she's saying if he gets in the offer, but does not sign it, does not sign it. And then the 47th hour decides, you know what? I think I am going to sign it. it but then he could not have called for highest investor. That's the question. Okay. By, Even though, okay. by countering, you're negating your option of accepting the asset. Gotcha. Right. Does that gotcha. make sense? Because I really, who, then you're, it's almost like, you know, you're the one driving the escalation costs. Because I'm countering of it with escalation. <laughs> and she brought it in with an escalation clause. I'm just riding up her price, right? I don't think that by yeah. putting that on eBay, like bidding on their own yeah. to raise the price, you can't exactly. do that. Yeah. Sorry, but let's say, uh, I know you're saying this. I'm just trying to make sense because, okay, this happened. But then the first offer comes in the morning. We have, and says you have 48 hours and it's an escalation clause. And we know that all the offers are going to come late this afternoon. Uh -huh. So, and there, uh, and everybody knows this is a multiple situation because it, multiple offer because of the craziness, you know, and, and the seller agrees that I let them know. And, uh, but it's, you know, very tight and all of them are high and, and, and they all say, please let us know. I mean, uh, telling them just do your best or your highest is, I, I, I don't feel like that. that yeah, you illegal. can't though. You can't. If you're going to accept an escalation clause, you cannot say, we are in multiple offer situations. Let me send out these addendums. Your highest investor due by Wednesday. You can't have that while having an escalation clause. They are contradictory. So your seller either decides, I don't want to select, you know, accept the escalation clause. We're going to call for highest and best offers by using these addendums, or he accepts, we're going to use this escalation clause and see the best we get. That's a choice. He also can't be countering and making his own. <laughs> raising his own bids, right? He can't do that if he chooses. Now, if he hadn't decided if he wanted to do the escalation clause and he puts in a counter offer, the escalation clause is no longer an option. He negated that by putting out a counter offer, right? Does that make sense? And you must notify the, the buyer's agent that we're not going to accept the escalation clause because we're, we're still in negotiations with others, right? It is about fair and honest dealings. And especially with him countering, He's the one running that deal, right? He's the one raising the price. So it would not be fair to a person that when they're escalating, because really who's the one, you know, bringing the fire? He already knows what their highest and best is. So now if I know that Rosanna has an offer and she's going to go to 530, that's her highest. And Kelly had submitted an offer and her offer was at 515. I could go back to Kelly and say, I'm going to counter at 535 because I have an offer at 530, right? That is not okay. That is taking information that is proving I mean, that I'm using it to raise the offer past her highest price. That's why they can't counter because they know too much. They already know your highest price. But hey, they Carrie, say, it's Teresa. Okay. Hey, Teresa. I, I'm, I'm wondering if what's confusing is, is that it says accepts, which sometimes accepts mean, means the seller's going to sign it. So, I mean, you're really not the seller doesn't, won't take the offer with the escalation cause if there's other multiple offers and he wants to call for highest and best, right? Correct. Correct. He's not accepting it. You got it. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah. Remember a seller who accepts an offer with an escalation clause, he doesn't know what it's saying here is that he doesn't know how much higher it would have gone because he couldn't do with the highest and best. Once he calls for highest and best, it's no longer an option to use the escalation clause. Because also too, what, so I know that, you know, Rosanna is willing to go to 530, right? I could go to everybody and say, listen, highest and best. We already have an offer at 530, but do we? No, mm -hmm. but do we kind of? Yes, yeah. right? This is gray and this is why you cannot do that because it's contradictory oh, to man. the buyers who submitted the offer telling us they're highest. So that's, it is complicated. Yeah. So the escalation oh, clause, yeah could assist your buyer in making getting the offer, but it also could be set, you know, turned down that we're not gonna do take accept your escalation, but we want you to put your highest and best in. This is awesome. Okay, I think yeah. I've got a question, Carrie. Get me. Okay. So to I, I Teresa, thank you for that clarification because that really helped me a lot. But okay, so if you're making an offer and someone calls for highest and best, uh -huh. can you at that point submit your highest and best with an escalation clause? 
Well, the problem is the reality is that seller should not be allowed to accept that escalation clause because he's already called for highest and best. You follow me? So as the agent, you have to know if they've already called for highest and best, you cannot. So you can't use that. Authority. No. I mean, it's like they knock each other out. Right, right exactly. Out. Now, you know, I, I'm not going to say that people aren't doing that. No, I'm not going to tell you that because, guys, this is being used wrong everywhere. But here's some of the reasons that you have to be careful. And it's really the code of ethics. Right. This is something that, so I want to kind of end it with the reasons why we have to be other than the obvious, right? Like fair dealings, honesty, you know, but for example, here we go. Article one standard of practice, realtors shall submit all offers and counter offers objectively and as quickly as possible. That's important, right? Two standard practice 115 Realtors in obligation to multi offer, offer situations in response to inquiries from buyers, cooperating brokers shall, with the seller's approval, disclose the existence of properties on the offer. But if that seller did not give you their approval, you do not need to disclose that information, right? Where disclosure is authorized, realtors shall disclose if asked whether offers were obtained by the listing licensee or another person in your firm or a different broker. Why is that important? Anybody? Because you may have said in your listing agreement, if I represent both sides, your commission changes, mm -hmm. right? Variable commission, right? That could very well be the case. Does that put the, a person's offer in a lesser stance? Yeah, because yeah. that's going to be less to the seller, if they still, you know, accept yours that you're coming in with, because they would have less commission to pay if they went with their licensee, which is why you're supposed to put in their variable commission. But that's a totally different point. So you follow me? So that's where that comes in. And it's important because the other side has to understand, is it a fair shot or not? Right? Yeah. Then uh, standard practice one seven says, when acting as a listing broker, the realtor shall continue to submit to the seller, all offers and counter offers until the closing or execution of the home, unless waived in writing. So what does that mean? That's that other box that says, we'll continue to accept offers. Do we wanna check the box or no? We want to continue to accept offers because we want backup offers. Because I will tell you, I just had an instance where uh, the realtor, did not notify for various reasons that they had loan approval by the end of the loan approval period. That gave the seller three days to cancel, which the seller exercised their right to cancel. This is critical. This is why if we're really representing our seller in the best way possible, we want to keep accepting offers, right? Because if the buyers on the other side do not follow the contract and tell you yes or no, we have loan approval and yes or no, we're going to continue, right? Because they could say we don't have loan approval, but we will continue. The seller can't cancel now, right? He can't initiate that cancellation. He's got to stick it out and see what happens now. Is that a problem if the closing date is three months in advance <laughs> or three months later, right? Yeah. <laughs> the seller's gonna be stuck. But if that listing agent didn't say we have loan approval by that loan approval period or don't have it, can the seller cancel and get out of that? Yeah. Yeah, that's exercising their right. So this is why it's critical to understand you wanna make sure you're still accepting those offers. I know some people are like, oh, I don't wanna throw off my seller. It's in your seller's best interest, especially in the market that we're in today to accept those offers, right? Because it gives them a better chance of if this deal for some reason doesn't come together, we have another offer. Uh, if you take backup offers, and it could be more than one, but then they'd have to be an order. What do you have to use? Anybody? Yeah, there's a backup offer, a addendum or something. Because yeah, most of yeah. our student today, did you drink <laughs> coffee or something? What's going on with you? You're doing great. You must have had that mentalist coffee. My son's like, oh, mom, this coffee is the thing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, but I could use some of that. <laughs> yeah, you can buy it everywhere now. <laughs> so the, the key with that is you're exactly correct. You got it right. And now I just realized what I asked you guys. Oh my gosh, what did I say? What did you just answer? 
there's an addendum. There's a backup yes, offer. It's a backup yeah. offer addendum. Yeah. You must use it. You must incorporate it into the cell. Let's talk about coffee. And I tell that. See, I obviously need some mentholist coffee. Yes, you can, but it must be incorporated in because if someone says, okay, I have a backup offer, but you didn't do that addendum, you didn't explain the terms of how the backup offer is going to work. It says in there what happens to the deposit. When does the contract become executed? What dates will follow after that? It's very clear. That's why we use addendums, right? And we don't write our own. Please don't do that. All right. So upon written request of a cooperating broker who submits an offer, the listing broker shall provide as soon as practical, look at this, guys, a written affirmation to the cooperating broker stating that the offer has been submitted. That is something that was added about two years ago, that if requested by the broker on the buyer side, then the listing broker must say whether or not it was submitted. That is an awesome thing. Hold on, Christine. Training. Running over. Okay, uh, so that's really important that you understand that. That is a code of ethics. If requested by the buyer's agent, really the broker, you can either show the seller has declined it, or obviously we'll know if they accepted it, right? Because they signed a contract. Or you can have the broker sign that it was presented. But to my point, why wouldn't we have the seller sign? It's a little fishy, right? Like, why wouldn't you just have the seller sign if they've accepted or rejected it? Make that part of your practice. It's good business practice. Okay. Article. Um, standard practice one eight realtors acting as agents or brokers shall submit the buyer's offers or counter offers until acceptance, but have no obligation to continue to show properties to their customers unless accepted in writing. That's part of the broker buyer agreement too. So if they put an offer, do we have to keep showing them properties? No. Are there buyers who would love us to do that? Yeah. Yes. So you can say, I'm sorry. Uh, because you have an offer in, we must hold until this offer, you know, unless you get signed and running set differently. And Article 1 states that when representing a buyer or seller, landlord, tenant, or other client or customer, because this is the National Association, right? Realtors pledge to protect and promote the interest of their customer, which is why I'm saying we have to be very careful about what we disclose and what we don't disclose, right? Because who are we you know, representing here. And one last thing, uh, standard one establishes requirements for confidentiality. But remember, we are not single agents. We are transaction brokers. So we have limited confidentiality, which gives us a lot more available opportunity. For example, being able to show a buyer's offer by crossing their name out, of course, because we do not have full confidentiality. So we are allowed to do that. Love letters or liability letters. So what is a love letter? This is a big thing that's come up a lot. You know, when the buyers are so excited and to help their offer get submitted, what they do is they send a little letter to the sellers, how they want to see themselves in the home. And oh my gosh, that family room is so amazing. I could just see my kids running down the hall at Christmas time, sitting in front of the tree, blah, 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 blah. What did I just do? I violated fair housing twice. I talked about family status. And I gave you an idea of my religion, fair housing. So this is where this is becoming an issue because when people are talking about their personal situations, not with, I mean, who would have thought talking about the kids running down the hallway for Christmas time, right? Would really be fair housing, but it is, it's fair housing violation. So what they're suggesting is if your buyers want to submit a letter, don't be the one who passes it off. If they want to send it to direct to the agent on the other side or to the customer on the other side, but don't be the one in between because if this does come up about fair housing, because the truth is that seller might be like, oh my gosh, I remember seeing my kids coming down the hallway for Christmas and it was so wonderful. But what are they basing that on? Religion, right? Oh, we're all sharing in Christmas together, right? I mean, it's ridiculous to some degree, but it's true also. You know, um, so the reason that these things were enacted, especially, for example, familiar status was to prohibit, especially sellers and landlords to not sell or rent to people who had kids. That was the point of where that came from. But that's not where we're at today. We can't talk about familiar status no matter what. Right. There's so fair housing has gotten uh, very much in the forefront of everything 
So this is where the love letters, but I love that they're calling them liability letters. That's really, really funny comes to pass. If it is shown that you have submitted it, if your seller uh, selects, if a seller selects it based off of that letter, if somebody challenges them and says, you discriminated against me because I don't have kids or blah, blah, blah. And that's why you didn't pick my offer. That's where fair housing can come into play. And we're in a litigious society and we don't want to get in that mess. So if you're a seller and your buyer, you know, the other seller, your buyer, however, <laughs> wants to accept those things. Listen, they're allowed to do whatever they want. I see the Morgan, Morgan commercial. Right, exactly. <laughs> I see it too. And I don't want to be part of it. Like I said, I don't look very good in stripes. Okay, guys. So, um, there's this agent, this downtown agent, and I've noticed on her realtor remarks, she encourages it to send a letter with the offer. Is that part of, that's not allowed, is it? Or Well, it's not that it's not allowed. I mean, honestly, to be honest, guys, there's definitely validity to the buyer sharing how they're going to love this home because this is a very much an emotional thing. That seller usually wants to sell to somebody who's going to love their home. Do they want to sell to some investor who's going to tear it up? No, they're going to sell to somebody who says, oh, this, why do they pick these colors? This is awful. We can't wait to renovate this mess. No, they get very attached to their home. So can I, would it be lying to tell you that these letters don't work? Oftentimes they do. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't say to buyers too, you might consider wanting to share a personal note, but you don't write it, number one. And now they're really strict about don't pass it on. Because it's not that it's a violation, right? But it is that there could be violation. Now, listen, if they were very benign, I love how your home has the beautiful lighting and I could really just love to sit and read a book and have a cup of coffee. Did we violate any fair housing? We don't know what they are. We don't know what their religion is. We don't know if they have kids. So not every letter will be a violation of fair housing. But could it be? That is the question. And you don't want to try to like go through your buyer's letter to take it off their housing stuff, right? I mean, now you're kind of participating in that. Like that, that's yeah. not a good thing, right? So if your buyer feels so driven to send this letter, who's to say they shouldn't? But you don't want to be part of it. I think, Carrie. Yeah. So I, I, I think they also, they don't, they don't, the buyer sometimes wants to, have the opportunity to say say something not just because they want to convince them but uh because we're in the middle and sometimes we keep them away and i think it's the right to also have a chance to say hey i want to say something you know so how do you suggest they send that if we cannot send it i would talk to the agent on the other side and share that my buyer feels so compelled to share a personal message to the seller would it be possible for you to share the email address of your seller so they could send it direct? Oh, wow. Or they could send it to their house. They could mail it, but you're in an offer situation and things are moving fast. Or the agent on the other side could say, listen. What about drop it by their house? I mean, now we're, that's a little weird. I would not recommend that. Like, no. But no. I mean, I think, it, I mean, just send it. An email or for example, again, does the listing agent want to be involved in passing that off? I mean, if I'm the listing agent, I don't. So that I'm going to tell you that honestly, not a lot of agents know about this. Not a lot of agents are thinking about this. They're not going to be worried about fair housing. Should they be? Yeah. yeah. I want my agents protected from it. But, you know, if they say, well, no, I don't want to give you my seller's email, but you can send it to me. They can send it to them. To, to if, them. if that's what they so choose. I wouldn't suggest it because it's like saying, I don't want to get caught in a fair housing, but housing violation, but you know, you're fine with it. So, <laughs> right? So if you share that, my buyers really wanted to share a message with the sellers, would it be possible for them to email them? And if that listing agent says, no, just send it to me. Right? But you didn't say, we're going to send it to you. You know? Here, you take them all. One each, baby. One of each. Okay. Any questions? I know we covered a lot of topics today, but I think that all this stuff is hugely relevant and important. Anybody? Two, yeah, two things on that um, on that example you just had. What if it's the other way, and your your listing agent and the buyer's agent says, "Hey, can I give a letter?" So you're saying we should say, mm, mm, "Prefer you not to." I would ask your seller if they would feel comfortable if they emailed them. Okay. Okay. 
And then the second question, going back to earlier, um, whenever we're calling for highest invest, how, how do you um, determine if it ever came down to that, that an agent, let's say on the buying side and that an agent called for highest and best? Is it if they put it in, if they verbally tell you, cause they could always dispute it. Is it if it's in the, uh, the MLS and they say calling for highest and best or so what constitutes that? Well, see, this um, is the thing, they don't have to call for highest and best and they can only do so if their seller says they can, right? So yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But if they do, and we say, hey, they call for highest and best. I would say after we submitted them. the escalation. Well, if you listen, if you submitted an escalation clause and they call for highest and best, you're well, not. How can they violation. prove they call? They called for it if it's in the. If well, it how would you know? I mean, they don't put it in real term remarks typically. It's usually a verbal thing. You know, so but do, well, ha, well, I, I got you. Okay, because it would come well, after. Unfortunately, at some point, we have to rely on the professionalism of the agent on the other <laughs> side, right? Okay. We yeah. can only yeah. control as much as we can control. Right, right. Okay, so, but you can always say to the agent on the other side, "Are they accepting the escalation clause?" So they won't be doing highest and best, right? Yeah. I mean, we okay. can guide them a little bit. Okay? Got you. Got you. Okay. okay what's your question. So. What is the standard ethical practice of putting multiple offer information on MLS then? Because you see this a lot right now. Is that something that we are supposed to be doing? Because I didn't think we were supposed to. Supposed to? No. Allowed to depends on your seller, okay. right? MLS is simply a portal to allow realtors to be able to share information. So it, that's why it always says not to be relied upon, right? In the MLS, there's disclosure on every page of that MLS. But the key is if the seller says, sure, let everybody know it's multiple offers and you put it in realtor remarks, you can't put that in public remarks. You're not going to put in public remarks, multiple offers, right? But if they put it on realtor remarks, which is where you've seen it, it's not, it's okay as long as the seller has authorized that. Thank you. Absolutely. Good question. Anybody else? Carrie, I, I know I asked you something similar the other day because I was in a multiple uh, offer situation and it was very, very stressful and I wanted to kind of review these and I think it might work for, I, I mean, I hope it works for everybody else. Uh, you know, I had two people that went to the open house and they said, you know, oh, if we go with her, you know, they had kind of have that attitude that if they get, go with me, they're going to be in a better situation. And you know, I'm very professional, so I, it doesn't mean anything to me, even though it would be great. It's not my, my, my sellers at first, you know, but then they were pressing me a lot to, you know, for information and all that. It was very stressful because I had to keep them like, no, you know, this is what it is and I'm not gonna tell you. But it got to a point that they were distracting me a lot. Like you put this offer and write it down and the offers were not even close. <laughs> to what we had already, multiple offers, a lot higher than that. So how do you approach that? The best I would way refer them out. If they become a problem, refer them out to uh -huh. somebody. Say, I have somebody in my office who I think would be fabulous. They could represent you, get them off your plate, you know, and who knows, maybe the other agent can either get them uh, at a better offer or certainly to another home, right? But if it's a problem for you, listen, what we did is we kept it to pure uh, limited confidentiality. We cannot share what the seller does not want us to share. They were asking and pushing for details that we did not have to give them. The seller did not allow for it and we did not need to give it to them. And they may have an opinion because they're from up north, for example, where they're used to single agencies where they're thinking we have to give them full confidentiality. And we need to remind them we are transaction brokers. And as transaction brokers, we provide limited confidentiality because our duty is to make sure that we deal honestly and fairly and we make this a win-win transaction for all parties. That's we'll what a transaction broker does. We'll, right? we'll still write the offer even if it's like, sure. that's, like, I mean, would you go ahead and take four hours of your time and <laughs> so write the offer? That's why I would refer them, Maria. I, you know how I feel about working with buyers in general. But yeah, I, <laughs> in I mean, that case, I would that refer them. I'm not even going to make it. Or yeah, but Maria, just because, listen, they're buyers. They're ready to buy a home. They might not be that home, but if you can refer them to somebody else, they could have worked the customers and maybe helped them find another home right. where you didn't maybe have the time to do that because you were so focused on trying to help your seller. 
That's why it would have probably been in the best interest of the buyer to refer them to somebody else. So, you know, but that's something that you're an independent contractor and as independent contractors, you have to make the decision. Can I truly represent both parties in the best way? If you can't, Listen, you go down a slippery slope if you start doing things incorrectly. So that's why I would suggest in an instance like that, refer it out. You get 25% if it closes on something, fabulous. <laughs> and more importantly, they're going to get somebody who's 100% focused on that. Yes, but, okay. to but, but if, if, if the situation is, because you might be able to represent them in another house, but the situation is, um, yeah, but remember, Maria, they're focused on the house you're focused on now. And if you can't give them the proper attention now, you could lose them as a customer completely anyway. Better to give them to somebody else, have them feel satisfied that they're being represented properly. And then hopefully they'll get the best home and you'll get 25%. All right, guys, I got to run. Unfortunately, we're way over, but I will be putting this up in the YouTube. Thank you all for coming. It was great seeing you guys and seeing your names. And I hope you've gotten some great information about escalation clauses, multiple offers, how and when to use them all. Have a great day. Oh, by the way, Thursday is a sales meeting. We'll be continuing in social media advance the week after. I forgot that it's the first Thursday of the month. So we've got Cinch coming. So we have a representative giving some great inside information. Bill's going to be telling us a little bit something about finding uh, really important property information, how to do it so easily. Maria is going to be sharing some stuff and I've got some really fun stuff to share too. So we will see you then. Have a great rest of your day.